Kieran, we are, we have extreme pleasure of welcoming an absolute legend on the show in Derek Ray. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Marcus and Kieran, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Marcus, obviously, I know your dad very well and have commentated on your dad's matches and following your career with interest too. Kieran, great to be on with you and yeah, looking forward to having a bit of fun and maybe coming at it from a slightly different angle. Yeah, and that's, that's the goal, of course. Yeah. And um, I guess the most pressing question is, what was it like commentating, uh, to commentating my dad? Well, he was a really good player. I mean, that was the one thing. Um, you know, people who get to know him nowadays, I think, get to know just this really, you know, nice bloke uh, from Norway who turns up at seemingly every big football match. But I remember how good a striker he was. I commentated on him scoring for Norway against Scotland in Oslo. Scotland won the game, but he scored the equaliser for Norway and, of course, had a great career. And I watched from afar, especially, I would say, his years in the Bundesliga with Eintracht Frankfurt. And I know he's very proud of those years and often gets called upon by German media to talk about the state of Eintracht, has his own column for one of the newspapers. And, yeah, he's... I think most of us see Jan Orge as one of the good guys in the game. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And we'll get back to that uh, with a question about, you, you know, in terms of the, the pronunciation, the respect yeah. for, you know, pronouncing Jan Oga, yeah, which it is yeah. in Norwegian. I would say Jan Aj. Yeah, Jan Aj, exactly, or Jan. <laughs> um, and going on that as well, the Bundesliga, you know, it's a very specially, what does it what does it mean to you? You obviously speak the language and, and have commentated mm. plenty of games on it. Yeah, it's something that's very dear to my heart. It goes back to my childhood. I was a very keen German student in the late 70s, early 80s. It was my best subject at school. And I used to have the secret world that I inhabited, which was basically a German radio world. Of course, in those days, there was no internet. Mm. We couldn't get German TV. But I could, in Aberdeen, where I'm from, get German radio from right across the North Sea, if you can imagine the geography. Yeah. So I would listen to NDR news, music, and, of course, above all, sports. So I would listen to what they call in Germany the Bundesliga Konferenz, which is basically all the games at once. And, you know, you switch from one venue to another and the commentators get very excited. So that's really where it all started for me. And then I did a spell in Germany, right on the border of the two Germanys, west and east, but on the western side, but looking right into the, the eastern side. I did a spell there as a, an exchange student and then as a language assistant. And so those years really formed to a large extent um, part of who I am nowadays. You know, I think it's true with everybody. What you did when you were young comes back to you as an adult, and I'm in my mid-50s now, but I still think back very fondly to that time in Germany and essentially as a young person living a bit like a German, sort of wanting to be more German than I actually was, I think it would be fair to say. <laughs> and, and on that topic as well, I mean, your love for language is, is apparent. And mm. if we go back in terms of, your broadcasting interest and then subsequent career i'd be curious if broadcasting came as a consequence of your interest yes in football but also your mm. love for linguistics i think it was all sort of rolled into one marcos yes i think if you go back to the 1974 world cup i still have cassette tapes and i'm really dating myself by talking about cassette tapes yeah, but yeah. that's what we used to record on i still have these cassette tapes of basically me impersonating the commentators in the 1974 world cup i was seven years of age at the time and you can sort of hear at that time my initial obsession with broadcasting with football of course because i fell in love with the game from an early age being from aberdeen and my father taking me to the the matches at the Todre, the aberdeen games but also the linguistic side and it was a couple of years after that that we began learning German, which was the language I really wanted to study. A lot of it had to do with that 1974 World Cup and the curiosity as to, you know, where Frankfurt was and, uh, you know, what was this business about um, two Berlins all about and two Germanys. And I think that happens for a lot of young people. I think it's where the football world, if you're really inquisitive, the football world can open the door to the wider world, you know, and... Uh -huh. 
I always say it's one of the great conversation pieces. Two people from totally different countries, different nationalities, can meet up somewhere. Maybe they have absolutely nothing in common, but generally they'll have football in common, you know. And I used to find that as a young person, even, you know, if I were traveling to a country that I didn't know too well, I'd be able to find a, a conversation moment through football. And it's uncanny how that happens still to this day. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Derek, as a commentator, you could say that there's a certain onus on having a distinct voice mm. and there's maybe the process behind that and to finding that voice that makes you recognisable. Can you tell us what that process was like for you? Well, I think you're right. I think as a commentator, you do have to have a recognisable voice. I think it has to be a clear voice and you have to realise that you're talking to, certainly in my case, I'm talking to a lot of people from many different countries at the same time. So, yes, you want to have your own style and people need to know, yes, that is commentator X and hopefully they like commentator X. There are always going to be people who don't. But I think yeah, you do have to have that um, that sound. It's not something that you fake. It's something that I think is part of you. I think it's like anything else. You can refine as you go. And if I were to listen back to my fledgling work when I was a teenager and doing amateur stuff, you know, I might nowadays go, oh, that wasn't as, as good as, as maybe I thought it was at the time. But it's a bit like a footballer, you know, the, um, the finished product of a footballer, you know, say at 27, 28, 29, is not the same as the footballer at 16, 17, 18 when you're learning. So, you know, I think you have to go through that phase and you have to make your mistakes as a broadcaster. You have to know that you can do that and you have to have bosses who understand that you're going to make those mistakes. And then hopefully with time, as with footballers, as you get older and you become more of a, a senior pro, so to speak, then, you know, you're making fewer mistakes. We're all human. We're all going to make mistakes in, in anything we do every day of the week, whether it's commentating football, whether it's doing the dishes. You know, we're, yeah. we're going to do things that we wish we hadn't done or said. But, yeah, I think it's, um, it's something I say to young aspiring broadcasters, really work on your voice and what I mean by that is listen to commentators who you respect, you know, ask yourself, what is, it, what is it that they do that you admire and try to work that into your own examples, into your own preparation. And so it's, um, it's not something you can master in a day. It's something that I think we're always working on mastering. And, and certainly, you know, every day I'm on the air, I'm learning something new, even at 54. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is like life. It's a, it's a yeah. continual process. And going on that, since you then started in radio at the hospital radio in Aberdeen, commentating yes. games in the 80s, obviously during the heyday of Aberdeen and, mm. and European football, football has obviously changed a lot. And yes. with any other industry, you have to adapt. But when you are commentating games then, and with the rapid change involved in football, has that forced a sort, sort of adaptation of your style so to speak i think styles do change um if you go from era to era but the basic formula behind what you do doesn't change you know i think it happens with music it happens with art it happens with football commentary as well there are these stylistic things for example i think in the 1980s for whatever reason most scottish broadcasters sounded a lot more posh than right. they do now, you know? Yeah. I think that was just something that was there. And I think it's because there were very few examples, you know, very few role models. Very few people actually were professional commentators. So the ones who were tended to come from this sort of posher, private school English background. So I think most of us, you know, mimicked that a little bit, maybe too much. Then I think in the 90s into the 2000s, and certainly now, people are much more themselves. And certainly in Scotland are much more confident about being themselves. So I think that has changed. I think in terms of the technical side of it, what's changed a lot is the fact that the co-commentator has become a lot more important. So when I started, we did have co-commentators on radio, on TV almost not at all. And I know, for example, in Norway, it wasn't really a concept that was in play at all to have a, an ex-player or a manager alongside you who could provide the tactical input. So that has got more and more prevalent, I would say, in the last couple of decades to the point where 
a lot of people want to hear from the co-commentator as much as the main commentator. I'm maybe a little bit old-fashioned. I always think that less is more and that nobody is going to criticise us for saying too little right. on TV because, of course, you can see the pictures yourselves. You don't necessarily need the commentator to tell you absolutely everything. And there was an old rule that a producer told me, which I think is still a good one to this day. Um, if you are not adding to the viewer's picture, then silence is golden. You know, So I think we could all live by that maybe a little bit more. I certainly count myself amongst those who from time to time probably, you know, at the end of the day, maybe have said too too much rather than too little. So it's something I think we're always working on, but that would maybe be the big change, that it's a lot more chatty now, a lot more conversational between two people, whereas before, certainly on radio, it was very much a description of what you could see, knowing full well that the person at the other end didn't have the benefit of TV pictures. So you actually, as the narrator, as the commentator, were the picture. Right. And that's why I think it's so impressive about commentators. I think when people do it, when they're in booths or as a part of like when they get to try it out, it's so much harder than people think, because it's yeah. like you say, it's adding to the to the viewer's experience and being able to succinctly put <clears throat> to words what you're seeing and to do that on the spot. Uh, you know, it, you're, you're painting a picture for the audience, which I think is, you know, all respect to you there for, for being able to do that, because that's it's so much t more tougher than I yeah. think that people think. Huh? Absolutely. So, yeah, Derek, if you go back to the the early days of your career. Yes, you moved to the U.S. ahead of the world, the nineteen ninety four World Cup, and you worked as a press officer during the tournament. And you also had <laughs> to meet your now wife at that tournament. Yes, and after right. that, you then uh, went on to establish yourself in America, and you started working MLS games. Why America, and what caused you to stay? It's a really good question. It's something that I, you know, think about quite a lot. It happened quite suddenly in the 80s. I wasn't all that interested in America as a young fellow. I was much more interested in Europe, whether it was Germany, whether it was Scandinavia, whether it was Eastern Europe. You know, I found Europe much more fascinating. But I remember one day um, a friend of mine, my oldest friend actually, had discovered the NFL and he took me into his living room and he said, just, just watch this. He goes, I want, you know, you've got an open mind. Watch this. And at that time, the NFL wasn't really a big thing in the UK or in Europe. It was still finding its way. And I remember watching it and I said, okay, I'll go into this with an open mind. And he was explaining it to me as I went along. And I thought to myself, that, that actually has a has a certain fascination behind it, you know, in terms of the, the tactical side of it, in terms of it being a completely different sport, but I could sort of see the, the sort of the inner chess game that was going on with the NFL. So, you know, I'd, I'd opened my mind to that. And then I opened my mind to baseball, which started to pop up on, on UK TV. And I thought to myself, I've never been to the, the, the US. I was single at that time. And I thought, um, next chance I get, I'm, I'm going to go. So I actually did. I, I flew to Boston on my own during uh, a break in the season. We didn't have too many breaks in the season, of course, back then yeah. in the late 80s. But I uh, made my way to Boston, went to Fenway Park to watch baseball, um, went to watch the Patriots, and sort of you know, thought to myself, okay, this is interesting. And then the, the following year managed to get some friends of mine to join me in the USA and it just sort of got me you know the wheels were, were were in motion I was thinking right the World Cup is coming to the USA in 1994 wouldn't it be fun to earmark that as maybe something I could somehow have an involvement with I didn't really know in what capacity I thought most logically as a broadcaster um, but it was during the 1990 World Cup which is my first World Cup on site in Italy that I met some people who were actually involved uh, in organizing the 94 World Cup and we got talking and we exchanged numbers and I made a few other journalistic contacts and it so happened one of them was actually the brother of the head of media for the World Cup organizing committee, a guy called Jerry Trecker, his brother Jim Trecker was looking after the media, a very respected figure. He'd been part of the uh, the Cosmos during their era in the 70s when Beckenbauer and Pele played for them. And um, so we got talking uh, initially on the phone and it just turned out that, um, that Jim Trecker and I really hit it off. And so I sort of made the move after 
um, the 90 World Cup, I, I made the, the decision, at least in my mind, not the move at that point, but the move in my head, that I wanted to, to try the US. I'd been for five years at the BBC in Glasgow. I'd been to 19 different countries covering football. And, you know, when you're young, you know, you guys can probably relate to this. You're sort of restless. You want to, you know, try it immediately and, and, and see what happens. And so I said, you know, what, I'm going to do this the difficult way. I'm just going to head out to America. I'm going to freelance a little bit. I'm going to do some studying, which I did as well. I enrolled at a, a local college, which I was probably, you know, too qualified for, but I wanted to get the feel of American journalism, just a small college that dealt in broadcasting. And so this enabled me to build some contacts, kept in touch with Jim Trecker, and lo and behold, shortly after that, I was offered a job. He said, I'd like you to be my man in Boston if you're up for it. They had the US Cup coming um, in 93, which was involving England, and they were to play in the, the Boston Foxborough venue against the USA. He said, so basically, you would be my eyes and ears and my press officer in the Boston venue for that and then for the, the tournament itself. So I had, you know, a couple of really happy years doing that. And my goodness, my, my level of, um, of knowledge with regard to, uh, you know, US media, US football, uh, picked up no ends. You know, I went from really having no knowledge at all to having to learn on the job. And one of the great things about that job was that unlike when you're a commentator, when you're on the inside, you have access to things and people that you certainly wouldn't otherwise. And of course, I was working with people in that job who were not necessarily football experts. They right. you know, were starting to, to, to like the sport. But of course, I was somebody who just wanted to live football every day. So um, you'll laugh at this. We would get these faxes. And of course, again, I'm dating myself by talking about faxes. But <laughs> yeah, we had we the cassette fax. and the faxes. It's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. On transfer deadline day, they still deal with faxes for right, whatever exactly. reason. But uh, we used to do, deal with them every day. And we'd get these faxes from the different football associations. And um, they would amount to requests by these associations for you know people to come in from their FA to have a look at training facilities in the Boston area, you know, readying themselves for playing at the World Cup and not knowing at that point where they were going to be drawn. So we had requests from everybody. And of course, most of the other people in the office didn't know who those people were. So, you know, I would get, I would read, a, I would say, oh, or somebody would say, there's a fax that's come through. There's a, a Mr. Dick Advocate who would like to come in and uh, and have a look at the training facilities. Or there's um, there's a guy called Egil Olsen from Norway who's coming in to have a look at the, uh, the, 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 the then coach at Drillo, as everybody um, knows him, of course, uh, the coach of, of Norway. And, um, so they would say, does anybody want to, um, you know, to, to drive these guys around? And of course, I'd go, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll do exactly. it. And, and so I, I sort of made these contacts with, with uh, you know, different football people um, just really as their as their driver. And of course, I told them I was the press officer. Yeah. And I think they were all a bit surprised that he was a Scottish guy working for the organizing committee who seemed to have some sort of football knowledge. Yeah. And um, so that that job was was absolutely terrific. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think back to just how much I learned um, before and of course, during um, the 1994 World Cup. It's interesting, because when you when you when you say that, it's Obviously, you have a unique talent in, in the way you, you commentate in, in your voice. But then again, success is, is not a random act. And with that, I mean, you are a result of a powerful set of, of circumstances and opportunities. Mm. And it's, it's such a great example of, of you having to meet the brother of the head of media, as is your broadcasting debut, for that matter, in terms of how you made your debut um, at, at the BBC at 19. But it's it's funny to see how those things tend to come together and be able to pivot you into now you are still in America because of maybe, you know, partly yeah. because of that. Obviously, it comes with talent preparation, but it needs to be opportunity. And I think that's a it's a it's a it's a nice reminder sometimes of how random things can be as well. Yeah, things can be very random, but I'm a huge believer that you can make your own luck to an oh, extent. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm yeah, sure it's the same, it's the same in football, isn't it? It's the same yeah. in football. I mean, you, when you're out on that pitch, you're looking for that moment when you make your own luck. You know, yeah. you, you know sometimes you can't control it, but you know you can do everything in your power to, to have that, that moment of luck. And that was always my philosophy as a young person. I, I thought, as long as I'm single and you know I can, can make these decisions for myself, I, I, I want my life to be about great experiences. You know, And I could have stayed at the BBC. I could have been very happy doing 
what I was doing, but I sort of felt, you know, in, in five years, I, I've done it. And um, I, I just sort of want to move on to the next chapter, whatever that is. And it could have been that it, it didn't work out for me at all in the USA, but I was lucky with that start. And, and then it sort of spawned something else with ESPN, because as a broadcaster, um, ESPN was on the cusp of starting its own service. They were about to buy the Champions League, which, of course, was, uh, you know, nobody knew what the Champions League was. They knew what the European Cup was. Was, but they were the initial broadcasters of the Champions League. They were broadcasting Dutch football, Brazilian football, Copa Libertadores from South America, and they needed a commentator, and they got wind of the fact that they had one uh, who was living not too far away who'd uh, just been working for the World Cup organisers. Derek, when, you're, when you were broadcasting on the early days of the MLS in the late 90s, yep. I'm wondering if this was unique and different from covering other leagues and i say yep. that because today still today football isn't the main sport in america mm. and back then it was a fraction of what it is right now and so i'm wondering if broadcasters and the media had to bring the energy and the hype and almost had to sell the game to the public in a way and i'm wondering if you felt that extra kind of layer of responsibility yeah i think so um you're right Kieran, I began with uh, MLS in 1996, so I've been working for ESPN. I was still working for ESPN, but th the big difference with uh, football in the US at that time compared to Europe, and it has changed in Europe a bit, but the big difference was each team had its own broadcasting crew. And so you were broadcasting on local TV, or I was. I was asked to be the local broadcaster for the New England Revolution. It did. It, it, what was great fun about that was that it meant I, I had this title that you would always want to have as a broadcaster. I was able to call myself the voice of the revolution. I mean, who wouldn't want? To, who wouldn't want to be the voice of the revolution? That sounds quite I mean, <laughs> but it's something great to have on your CV, oh, the former, the vice of the revolution. Oh, that's um, you should just have that. You should just call yourself that, honestly. <laughs> well, I did it for the first few years um, with the New England Revolution, but there are a number of challenges when you're broadcasting in that kind of environment. And the, the big difficult one for me was I was covering a, a very poor team, arguably the worst team in the league for the first three, four years of the existence of MLS. And, of course, your money is being paid primarily by the team itself. Now, I had a very understanding general manager, an Irishman called Brian O'Donovan, who encouraged me to be honest. Um, and, and, and I tried to be honest. And there's actually a broadcast I did when Walter Zenga, the, the famous, the great Walter Zenga, was the coach, but he wasn't a very good coach of New England when he was in charge, when uh, I, I really had a, had a go at him. And a lot of people thought I was going to lose my job, but Brian said, no, he said, this is, this is what we're trying to create is kind of more honest media. But it was the exception rather than the rule. And I think I felt a lot of pressure during those years to, to tow the party line and certainly to tow the MLS party line. Um, it wasn't really looked upon favorably to criticize uh, referees, for example. You couldn't really say that the referee had a bad game. They didn't really want you saying that players had a bad game. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you, you can back me up on this, but as a player, you know when you've had a good game and when you've had a bad game. And I don't think you would want somebody to say every time you've had a great game when you haven't. You know, I, I think yeah. honesty is part of football. And I saw that as my job as a broadcaster. I wasn't trying to have a go at anybody. I just thought it was part of the educational process for American viewers at that time to learn the difference between a really great performance, an average performance, and a not so good performance. Yeah. And Eventually, I sort of just I ran out of um, um, energy for that particular project because I felt that we were being asked to to put sugar on on everything a, a, a bit too much for my taste. And um, ESPN at, at that point had sort of said we'd love it if you would come back and do you know they had Serie A at that point, um, they had La Liga at that point, and they actually had Scottish football at that point uh, for the world. You know for for um, uh, the viewers around the world. So they said, we'd love it if you'd consider coming back and doing more. So I, I made that decision around 2000 to, to not do the MLS uh, games and to, to focus 100% on, on the world football scene. Yeah. And going off that a bit then, and you, you mentioned it briefly when you were with press officers, well, what, is, what are the big differences between, say, US journalism and, and, and UK journalism? If you use that as an example. 
Well, I think there are a number of differences. I think um, access is a very big thing for journalists in the US, and I think they often colleagues who I speak to, they're often a bit dismayed if they ever go to Europe and find out that the access is not as great. You've probably yeah, all they seen... Sit and talk to someone while they're in their towel, <laughs> in the shower. Right, and, yeah. and you know, yeah. I don't know how you'd, how you'd feel about that, Marcus. I don't know. I don't if you... know. As long as they took pictures, then not... Marcus would embrace it. <laughs> 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 no, it's totally different. That is a big difference, of course. Yeah, yeah you know, so if you're an American journalist, you, you are sort of feeling entitled to go into the dressing room and to talk to everybody, you know, and it's almost an affront if you don't get that access. Whereas in Europe, I think it's more of a halfway house whereby there is access, um, but there are also lines of demarcation. And certainly, you know, the idea of a journalist walking into the, the dressing room, I, I, I'm not sure I can, I can imagine that. I'm actually not sure it's necessary either. I think mixed zones can work really well. I think they are the nice halfway house as long as you have, um, I, I think it takes sometimes a cooperative uh, press officer or somebody on the staff of the club who understands that mix zones are actually the club's friends and publicity is the club's friends and um, I think with with clubs down the divisions it's it's less of a problem but I, I certainly see it with the biggest clubs in Europe especially in England I'd have to say but you know Rangers and Celtic at various times have, have not been great for it um, the idea that they have to hide the players away that that it's not in their interests to to give the media anything so I think that's one of the big differences I think also if you're looking journalistically and certainly if you read newspaper articles or you know online articles nowadays American journalism is much more driven by the quote so in other words if they were talking to you after a game they would listen carefully to what you've said they'd probably take it down on a recording device and then you know retran and then transcribe it and then you know the piece would be about you know Marcos Fjortoft says this and they would make the piece about that whereas I think in um, in UK journalism the quote is is kind of there but it's more there to support what the piece is going to or was going to say anyway if you right. get my drift right right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense Derek you've been fortunate enough to cover sev several major international tournaments yeah and I'm wondering in your opinion what factors need to be in place to make a good tournament and which one stands out for you yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough to be a part of every World Cup since 1990 in one capacity or another, and every Euro tournament in one, well, as a commentator, uh, in every Euro tournament since 2008. So quite a few to choose from. I, I think it comes down to often this kind of combination of circumstances. You need, first of all, the the venue or the host country to be special and to have that special atmosphere. This is why I was never a huge fan of what we've just gone through with the Euros, having all these different venues. I understand why they did it, but I don't think you're ever going to have that same feeling that you have in one country where it all um, feels as though the world has arrived, you know, on your doorstep. And um, so hopefully that will be the, the norm going forward. Um, Having said all that, of course, the football has to really click. And I've been to many tournaments where it hasn't. You know, my, my first one, 1990 in Italy, I, I've got great memories of it um, just because it was Italy and, and, you know, who wouldn't want to be in Italy for the World Cup? But the, the tournament was not, a, was not a pretty tournament. The games were not um, of the highest calibre. 94 in the States, again, I'm a little bit biased because I was on the inside there, but that was the first World Cup that we had with uh, full crowds everywhere. You know, it, it's hard to... To really? imagine that now, yeah, until 1994, it was not a thing to have sellouts at, at games. You know, in um, in 1990 in Italy, they, they were not all sold out. Same in Spain in '82. Um, so, so '94 was kind of a, a bit of a sea change. And you know, people imagined, oh, the USA is not going to be interested, but Americans do love big events. So that's when it really turned. Um, I think it was one of the better tournaments as well. I'm not going to say the absolute best. Um, so they've all sort of had their moments, but the, 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 the tournament that I've enjoyed most of all, I would have to say, would be 2008 Euros. Uh, that was a tournament that just seemed to, from the very start, produce amazing games and great stories. And you know, some of my favourite games as a commentator have come from that tournament. I, I remember... Um, 
Turkey's come back against the Czech Republic when they were 2-0 down and somehow came back to win 3-2. And, and that was one of the themes of that Euro, was that, that the Turks just were indefatigable. They, they Whatever they did, they could fall behind, that they kept coming back and made it all the way to the, the semi-finals against the odds. But there was some other terrific football from Spain in particular at that Euro, from the Netherlands, from Germany, and so on and so on. Um, I think the last World Cup in, in Russia was one of the better ones, funnily enough. Um, I, I, that, that would be one that I would put in the, the top three. But you could ask somebody else and you would get different answers. Yeah. I think based on the games that he or she saw for themselves. I was actually at that final in the yeah. 20, 2008 one, the Spain-Germany one. Yeah. Torres chipped Lema, was it? Uh, yeah, it would have been Lehmann, yeah. 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 I, I was at that final, actually. Yeah, yeah. Park, well. yeah no, it's, good it's, seats. <laughs> yeah. I was actually, uh, yeah, it was, it was good seats. I, I, haven't, I haven't been to too many games late, like recent times, but yeah. that was that's one that stands out right behind where they were left the trophy. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think yeah. one of the best, one of the best for sure. No, it was very good. I guess it's also the romanticism of when you're a kid as well. Yeah. And, and being at the tournament as well. And, and I guess the reason I we had that question as well is in terms of immersing yourself on what is outside of the tournament as well as what well, as the country itself and i guess yeah. you know for a place like that's the beauty of a tournament as well a place like russia where you you know not meant to, all too many people would go to to visit and having that kind of impression was that part is that part of what plays into the experience as well in terms of what's what the country is like it certainly does i i think that um it was quite an exotic World Cup for a lot of people. I'd been to Russia before for the Champions League final in, what year would that have been, 2008? That, that eight as well, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, 2008, if my memory's correct. Um, so, yeah, um, Russia had its own feel. And, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that is, again, it goes back to the answer I gave you earlier about football representing the world you know and and this whole kind of you know as as little children i think many of us had an old-fashioned globe and we would point you know these different places on the globe and and imagine what it might be like to to be there and i used to imagine what it would be like to cover football in these exotic places so um to be able to go to russia and and do that probably something that uh, that i didn't imagine i would i would have the chance to do pimp society can paint on anything you want Femme Society is a creative outlet for both you as a customer and then me as a creator. Now you can currently go on the website, fill in a form, and then you'll get, um, we'll communicate through email. Derek, you're often known for how thorough and diligent you are as a commentator, and an example of this is you researching how to uh, pronounce players' name and even sometimes how the country or the language pronounces their name. And I don't know if this is a naive question, but in your opinion, why is it so important not to overlook the pronunciation of a player's name? I think it comes down to basic respect. We all have names that are part of us. And I think at different points in our lives, we probably, you know, are happy enough to have those names watered down just for reasons of communication. But as somebody who studied languages from a young age, I used to be well aware that, that many broadcasters on TV were getting names wrong. And I could do that with German because I was a, a fluent German speaker from a fairly young age. And I could tell that many of the British commentators who were covering German teams, German players, were not getting the names right. And I was thinking, well, okay, I could sort of understand if you get a name wrong because it's such a mouthful. But these weren't mouthfuls. These were just normal German names that would have been correct with a bit of care. So I think it comes down to this. You know, I... I you know, if we had our names mispronounced by somebody over and over again, I think we would probably say, oh, by the way, just so you know, I pronounce it this way, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I think uh, somebody would, in response to that, go, oh, sorry, I, I, I genuinely didn't know, you know? So to me, it's just something that we can get right if we want to. And there's just a little bit of laziness, I think, involved in, in not getting it right. So it comes down simply to respect. I don't believe that there really is such a thing as an anglicized version of a name you know I, I get it with with you know cities i get it that we say paris and not paris 
you know, I get it that we say Naples, you know, I get it that we say Seville and not Sevilla for the, the cities. But when it's somebody's name, there is no equivalent of that name. We don't go around translating names into, into other languages. The name is the name. So as far as possible, if we can get that name right, then we should. That, that to me, is the simple maxim. I, and I came across uh, one of your anecdotes, so to speak, and it, it was a really, it was a really touching story. As it, you'd gone up to a, I forget his the yeah. player's name, <laughs> fittingly yeah. enough, and uh, <laughs> you asked him how it was pronounced, and you pronounced it during a game, and he came to shake your hand at yes. a later point, and because his dad had finally heard um, his son or his family name, which yep. in this case is a good example of of the respect his family name actually being pronounced correctly on TV. And I, I thought that was a really, really good story to, to represent that. Yeah, it, well, it was a player actually in Scotland. It was a player who had been at Falkirk. Um, I caught up with him when he joined Dundee United. He was to play for Hibs as well. And his real name is Farid El Alagi. That's how he pronounces his name. Now, I'd heard it being pronounced differently. I think Alagui was, was what he, people had been calling him. And... This was my rule. Um, uh, obviously, sadly, I'm not in Scotland anymore, but when I used to work in Scotland, I would always, before a game, I'd always be right there in the tunnel area. And, of course, I knew what every player looked like. So if there was a new player, then I would just go up to him and introduce myself and explain, you know, my name's Derek Ray. I'm the commentator for BT Sport. I would say, could you just say your name as you would say your name? Not as somebody else might say it, but how do you say your name? And that's what I did with Farid. And um, I remember him saying to me at the time, oh, he goes, well, he goes, my, my father, I think my father is watching the game tonight. He was, he's, he was visiting. Um, I think he was in London at the time. So, um, so that'd be good. And then it was several weeks later when our paths crossed again that he came up to me and shook my hand and he said, yeah, he said, thank you. Thank you for that. Because it's the first time I've heard anybody in the UK get our family name right. And that put a big smile on my face because I thought to myself, yeah, you know, this is, this is, it's a small thing, but it's really not such a small thing because that is the family name. And um, there's a tendency, I think in the, and you can, Agree or disagree, Marcus? I think mostly in the Anglo world, there's a tendency to be a bit lazy about names. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. they're they're everything they're, is shortened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's also in the word uses of the S's or the double L's and stuff like that. It's just it's easier yeah. because it just takes. That's that's with a lot of things because it's easier yeah. to stick to our own uh, narrative if we're going on a wider perspective. We don't have to go that deep. Yeah, uh, yeah, Kieran. No, no. Um, Derek, I would. <laughs> I couldn't have you on and not ask you about one question about FIFA because sure. obviously it's been a big part of my childhood and, and you came on at FIFA 19. That's right. And you've been a uh, lead commentator, head commentator since FIFA 21 or 20? 21. 21, 21 was my first one, yeah. yeah. And for if someone's listening, they don't know, but it's obviously the very illustrious video mm -hmm. game football franchise. And... Obviously, over recent times, it's become it's one of the most sold video games in the world. Mm. But it's also taken a part of within a wider football culture, you know, as, as football is starting to expand within what may be, you know, uh, like the, the design of strips or boots or whatnot. It's become part of the wider football culture. I was wondering if you have noticed a since joining, if, if, if there's a key insight you derive from it or if there's an increase in popularity for yourself if, if there's been a shift since you took on fifa obviously you've well known before it but if there was something i don't know different when you became a part of fifa yeah i, I think you know when you take on a, a gig like fifa you know the iconic game that it is you know that it's going to introduce your work to younger people to to new fans new football fans i would say and i think the one thing i've realized is that a lot of the FIFA fans are not necessarily huge fans of watching football week in, week out. I mean, that's the background I come from, obviously, is is watching football week in, week out, whether it's big time football or, uh, you know, sixth division football or, or football in the park. Um, but I think a lot of the people who are, are huge FIFA fans, they're fans of the big name players, they're fans of the big clubs. And... I think from the point of view of my work, it, it, it's introduced it, obviously, to, to a new segment of the audience, let's say. And, you know, they can be complimentary or they can sometimes be negative. You know, no, I think that's... On Twitter, they're negative on Twitter. <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, I think, I think that, that emphasizes the difference. I think um, 
my generation is not really the social media generation, although there are people of my generation on, on social media. I'm on social media. But I think um, younger people have grown up with social media. And I think with that has come a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to everything, you know. And, and you have to learn to take that in your stride a little bit. You know, you have to learn, you know, I will see things on social media directed at me, probably because of FIFA. Um, but I've learned not to react too often because if you do that, then you'd be doing nothing else but, but react. Whereas my generation tended to sort of say, "No, well, you would never, you would never, you know, say something to to, to somebody you didn't know, you know, unless you really had thought it through." But social media has led to kind of, oh, "I'll just say anything, and maybe they'll regret it later," you know. And um, I've had people apologise a few hours later, saying, "Ah, oh, I was having a bad time. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that," yeah. you know. So, and I think that's the world. That's the world we live in. Um, so, so I, I would say it's definitely opened my work to um, to new football fans. I, th I think of that. There is absolutely no doubt. And in fact, there are some people who only know my work on FIFA. You know, who who because maybe they're they're not watching ESPN, who I work for in the US, because they can't because they don't live in the USA. Maybe not watching the Bundesliga. Maybe not watching the tournaments I've covered. Maybe at the age of seventeen, they only know me as the the FIFA commentator, which is absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's it's part of it. That's why I mean, it's yeah. of my, my father. People only know him as a pundit and forgot the yeah. other, you know. And then because to yeah. a new audience, because they don't have that exposure. Uh, that's just yeah. how it is. Um, it's funny. We isn't have it? a yeah. few ending questions. Yes, just a few uh, ones uh, to, to you know you've experienced a lot. Um, and I guess the first question we want to ask is the favorite, and this is probably one you get a lot, mm. if your favorite game that you have commentated on or, yeah. Favorite game. That one I can answer pretty easily. Favorite game as a commentator. And again, as a commentator, you have to be lucky to be in the right place at the right time. Well, I was in the right place at the right time in 2005. I was in Istanbul when Liverpool produced the comeback of all comebacks against right. Milan in the Champions League final. And it's amazing to think back because at 3-0 Milan, and it was 3-0 to Milan, and they were the best team in the world at that time you know from my point of view um at three nil i thought this is dead and buried and you know, we should really make sure we're on top of what the record score has been in a european final because i had fears that it might get really ugly in the second half but of course for liverpool to produce that comeback and then for it to go to penalties and yet as he do deck to be the the hero doing his best Bruce Grobelar impersonation. Right. Grobelar had been the goalkeeper from uh, just over two decades prior in the final against Roma. Um, to have all that come together in a final, it just doesn't get any better than that. So I always say that that, for me, will go down as the best game that I will ever cover. I I'll be stunned if there's one that can top it. So so that stands out. Oh, it's not. That's a good, good answer. Yeah. yeah. What is the best stadium that you've commented in? Well, there have been a number of really good ones. I'll, I'll tell you my favourite one. My favourite one is the, the Zignari Duna Park in Dortmund. That, oh, that is my favourite. And yeah, I, I never tire of going there. There's just, you know, I've been lucky enough to be there, be lucky enough to bump into your dad there on quite a few occasions. Oh, yeah. And um, it's just magic. You know, there's just something about it. It's a true football city. It's, you know, the industrial heartland of the game in Germany. And you know when you go there for a big match, you know that it's going to be special and you know that there's going to be some sort of story. And I, I always say that if I had the chance to pick the, the stadium to do my last commentary, that would be the one I would pick. But, you know, you don't, you don't get the, that sort of choice in life normally. But uh, no, that would be my favourite. It's not necessarily the most glamorous stadium in the world. I mean, it's, it's a great-looking stadium and, the, you know, the steep stands and the, the, uh, the Zoo Tribune, the, the okay. South Stand. Yeah, it, it's, you know yourself, Marcus, it's just special. Kieran, just because he said Signal Iduna Park doesn't mean he I doesn't like Celtic Park. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just like that's his opinion. And <laughs> that's right. He had the best I mean, experience I've there. I've been trying to hold back and not mention Celtic <laughs> during the season. So. No, you Plus, can get it all out. Nah. We're, we're, we're nearing our end. You can I ask that. I don't want to be so narrow-minded. There's nah, a lot nah. of other things to cover. I'll say this much. I have been seldom... When I went to I went to a Champions League game there, it was uh, yeah. versus Dortmund Arsenal. Arsenal actually happened to win. and yeah. um, But I remember going there... And I was completely just like blown away. It was just yeah. like yeah. insane. But having said that, I have not shameless, like I have yeah. not yet to attend 
uh, a, an old firm yeah. or a European night at it's Celtic Park. Yeah. There haven't been that many highlights in the Euro- well, European nights, but yeah. lately, but. I would like then. Then we can that have a discussion. All happened before you were you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, yeah. and 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 Celtic Park on a European night <laughs> is very very hard to beat. Um, yeah. You just need to ask any of the German coaches. In fact, that always comes up when teams get drawn with Celtic. There's always this kind of excitement. Oh, we're going to experience something yeah. really special. So oh, it's yeah. a special place. Yeah. yeah. All right. I can, we, we, you I settled can now. Don't, that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> we just end it. Or? Yeah. No. We don't want more. <laughs> I guess the, the last question for you then, Derek, is uh, whether you give us your only player or top three players hmm. you've watched that have completely wowed you, that you've been totally dazzled by. Ooh, um, to narrow it down to three is difficult, but I, I, I will try. Um, I think if you, where would I go? I, I think I'd have to mention Maradona as one of the three because I'm of that age I'm I'm kind of the Maradona generation you know I was yeah. born in the late 60s Maradona came along in the late 70s so his entire career I was watching at all the the major tournaments and of course for Napoli as well which was was very special and I don't think there's been a player like Maradona since you know who who had the capacity to dominate a game in that manner with a flair for the dramatic and even Mm -hmm. you know in 1994 obviously in Boston being the press officer all those if you look back at the footage all those heroics happened in our venue in in Boston so yeah so Argentina ended up being our our team so on a number of levels you know um yeah, Diego Maradona would have to be on the list um the other two that I'll give you uh Franz Beckenbauer who I think um, reinvented the the idea of what a defender was, you know, mm-hmm. because prior to that, defenders had all been sort of big, tough, robust guys that that did basic defending. Beckenbauer had this new interpretation. You know, he was a he was the first playmaker um, from the back. You know, libero as it was termed in in Germany and. Uh, I've been able to sit down with him a few times for interviews, and um, when you get to do that with one of your heroes, it's uh, yeah, it's difficult to to beat that. Yeah, um, so Beckenbauer, and then the other one, and and I think probably my first football hero because of when you know this happened and when he was at his very best, uh, Johan Cruyff. Um, 74 World Cup, synonymous with that World Cup. The Netherlands didn't win it. But again, I'd just say to people, have a look at the footage. Have a look at what, what he did. Have a look at what the great Dutchman did in that World Cup. And again, somebody who I think um, revolutionized football in many respects as a player and then as a coach with his vision, um, the sort of the total football vision that he had, and obviously a deep thinker off the pitch as well. So yeah, I don't think I'd go too far wrong with, with those three. Krijf, uh, that's, a, that's a good yeah, Top and power and Maradona, yeah. top three, and uh, obviously, uh, your dad and myself or yourself are the same age. Yeah. I've heard, yeah, I've had to, I've had to be exposed to those type of players and, and their significance <laughs> for yeah. of your time in terms yep. of your hero. So, um, yeah, I can only, I can only imagine. What I, I, I imagine his three might be similar, or he probably yeah, no, has exactly a, it's the same, yeah. same, you know, yeah. same appreciation, and and you know, those are three pretty up there as a, as the all time. Um, yeah. There, I really appreciate you taking the time. We have one favor we'd like to ask you. Of course. And I, I'd like to see how it would work. But we yeah. would love if we could close out the episode similar to how you would close out a game. And okay. see how that works. If, you're not, if, you, <laughs> if you don't feel like you comfortable with it, it's no problem. But we'd like to at least inquire so to speak well how do, do you which teams do you want involved do we want celtic and no, no, i don't we know want, we want that it, a close for the podcast so we're saying oh. okay we're here with uh i don't know how you would do it okay we'd like to see if if that would be possible here we go i'll give this my best shot okay. not having yeah. known this was I coming I'm, i mean i, I, I asked kieran how to frame this question yeah. now i'm very excited <laughs> <laughs> well, we went into this game thinking that Marcus and Kieran would have fantastic questions to ask. I'll tell you what, they didn't disappoint on any front, and it was thoroughly invigorating. And there goes the final whistle. It's all over here. I think we can chalk this one down as a huge success. Three points in the bag, and on they go to the next one. And that's it from Celtic Park. Always atmospheric here. Until next time, this is Derek Ray saying, Good night.